Hello and welcome back to your next class on the content of procedural obligations. Today we'll be discussing it from the unbiased and independent decision maker's point of view. The principle of unbiased decision making is the second limb of the rules of the natural justice. The courts ask whether the situation of the decision maker creates a sufficient risk of an impermissible degree of bias instead of inquiring into their actual state of mind. Direct pecuniary or other material interests in the outcome of a matter disqualifies an adjudicator or a decision maker. And even the slightest inkling of the financial interests can still disqualify them. In Canada, bias is determined by reference to common law standards, except when a statute addresses the questions of bias. The most important norm is Section 7 of the Charter, which guarantees the benefit of the principles of fundamental justice when someone's life, liberty or security of the person is at stake. To understand bias, impartiality and independence, it is necessary to explain their relationship. A decision is biased if it is based on illegitimate interests or irrelevant considerations. Impartiality refers to the state of mind or attitude of the tribunal in relation to the issues and parties in a particular case. Independence refers to the complete liberty of individual judges to hear and decide cases without interference from anyone. The Canadian courts use the test of reasonable apprehension of bias to determine whether an adjudicator or decision maker should be disqualified. The court is not concerned with the apprehension of bias, but rather the possibility of actual, it could be unconscious, but actual bias affecting the decision maker's weighing for competing considerations and making unfair decisions. Antagonism during a hearing refers to a conduct of attitude displayed by a decision maker or lawyer that raises reasonable apprehension of bias. This conduct can lead to disqualification of the decision maker or a lawyer. It is important for decision makers and lawyers to maintain balanced and proper behavior during the hearing to ensure a fair and impartial process. Let's discuss the case of Marquis versus Dilex. This case highlights a conflict of interest dispute in the context of labor relations. In this case, the Ontario Labor Relations Board certified a union, but the employer challenged this decision, claiming that one of the members of the board had a conflict of interest. The board member in question was a lawyer who had previously been a member of a law firm that represented a union affiliated with the one being certified. The employer argued that his past that this past connection could have influenced the board's decision to certify the union. However, the judge dismissed the employer's challenge, noting a few key points. First, the vice chairman of the board had no involvement with the present proceedings. Second, the board member's association with the law firm had ended almost a year before the case, which meant there was no ongoing connection. And finally, the judge pointed out that it is common practice for the government to appoint individuals with prior association to such boards. The employer's argument that a judge in a similar circumstance would not have heard the case was not considered detrimentative in this context. The case of Marquis v. Dialects Limited thus serves as an example of how conflict of interest disputes can be resolved within labor relations. Moving on to the next case, in the case of United Enterprises Limited v. Saskatchewan, United Enterprises operated a licensed restaurant and tavern and its liquor permit was suspended by the authority for violating the Alcohol and Gaming Regulations Act. United then applied for a review for the suspension orders by the Commission. On October 2nd, the Commission held a hearing and upheld the authority's suspension orders. Additionally, the Commission made a further order removing United's treating privilege. However, the hearing left United with the perception that the Commission was showing more deference to the Authority's Council than to its own. The perception was exacerbated, which means making it worse, when the Commission's Chair confirmed her invitation to the Council to attend her barbecue that evening. This case highlights the importance of Audi Alterum Partum Principle, which is part of the rules of natural justice and the duty of fairness. This principle requires tribunals to maintain an open mind and be free of bias, both actual and perceived. Informal proceedings or familiarity between the counsel and the tribunal do not necessarily lead to a reasonable apprehension of bias, but tribunals must conduct themselves in a manner to avoid any such perception. In this case, the judge emphasized that impartiality is crucial 
and that any conduct that could lead to perception of a closer relationship with one side's counsel over the other should be avoided. The test of bias depends on the circumstances under which the tribunal operates and a reasonable person in the same situation as an applicant must apprehend bias for it to be considered an issue. The next case we'll be discussing is Committee of Justice and Liberty versus National Energy Board from 1978. The main legal issue in this case was whether the involvement of the chairman of National Energy Board, Marshall Crow, in the discussion and planning for the construction of a gas pipeline created a reasonable apprehension of bias. The Supreme Court of Canada sided with the participants in the hearing, agreeing that Crow's involvement in the discussion and the planning created a reasonable apprehension of bias. The court held that the degree of involvement of the decision makers is directly proportional to a reasonable apprehension of bias. Justice Laskin explained that the problem with a reasonable apprehension of bias arises when the decision maker participates in working out some of the terms on which the application is later made and supports the decision to make it. This creates a reasonable apprehension of bias even if there is no actual bias. In this case, the Supreme Court of Canada found that Crow's involvement in the meetings and the decisions that dealt with the advanced plans for the pipeline created such a reasonable apprehension of bias. In the next case is Township of Vespra versus Ontario Municipal Board. In this case, Vespra Township made an application to annex a land from the neighboring Oro Township. The hearing was conducted by the same members of the Municipal Board who had made the decision in an earlier related matter known as the Innisfil case. The Municipal Board refused to receive any new evidence due to a deadline imposed by the Municipal Boundary Negotiations Act and made a decision based on the evidence from 1976. Vespra objected that the presence of the same board members created a reasonable apprehension of bias. The legal issue in this case was whether the presence of the same board member in a hearing which had connections to an earlier matter heard and decided by the same exact board gives a rise to a reasonable apprehension of bias. The Ontario Divisional Court found that the board's decision was based on the evidence from 1976 without considering any change in circumstances over the seven-year period and without evidence of population projections. The board's refusal to hear evidence was considered a denial of the obligation to give a hearing. As a result, Vespra's application for review succeeded and the court concluded that there was a reasonable apprehension of bias. The court determined that the presence of the same board members in a hearing that has connections to an earlier matter heard and decided by the same board does not necessarily give a rise to a reasonable apprehension of bias However, if the decision is made without jurisdiction, contrary to the natural justice and based on outdated evidence, a reasonable apprehension of bias may be inevitable. Moving on to the next topic, now we'll be discussing the attitude of a decision maker, which is attitudinal bias. Attitudinal bias refers to a bias that a decision maker may have based on their preconceived opinions, beliefs and other attitudes about a particular issue or subject matter. This type of bias can arise from personal experiences, culture or societal norms or other factors that may influence the decision maker's perception and judgment. When a decision maker has an attitudinal bias, they may be more likely to make decisions that are influenced by their personal views rather than impartiality and objectivity. This can create a reasonable apprehension of bias when it results in the perception that the decision maker is not impartial or objective in their decision making. It is important to recognize and address attitudinal bias as it can affect the fairness and impartiality of the hearing process. By identifying and addressing potential sources of attitudinal bias, decision makers can ensure that their judgments are based on objective evidence and a fair evaluation of the facts, rather than being swayed by personal beliefs or opinions. The first case we'll be discussing on this topic is Payne versus University of Toronto. The legal issue in this case was procedural fairness and the absence of bias in the decision-making process for the grant of tenure to a professor. The court found that there was a procedural unfairness in the decision-making process due to the chairman of the tenure committee appointing a senior member of department who had previously submitted a negative assessment on the candidate's suitability for tenure. This appointment was found to be in violation of the principles of impartiality and fairness. The court held 
that the members of the tenure committee must act on their own knowledge of the candidate as well as the assessments of the references provided to them. However, their own views should not be found based on prior knowledge of the candidate's suitability for tenure and must remain impartial. If there is evidence of manifest unfairness, the courts may intervene and substitute its own view for those of the review committees. This case highlights the importance of procedural fairness and impartiality in the decision-making process, particularly in academic settings where the tenure decisions have significant implications for the careers of candidates. Now moving on to the next case, which is Large versus Stafford City from 1992. The legal issue in this case was whether or not there was a reasonable apprehension of bias in regards to the chair of the board, Professor Robert Kerr. The employer argued that Professor Kerr was biased due to the public statements he made as the president of the Canadian Association of University Teachers about general desirability of mandatory retirement. The court decided that there was no reasonable apprehension of bias. It noted that Professor Kerr was called upon to decide a different issue, whether the evidence established that retirement age at 60 was bona fide occupational requirement for the Stafford Police Force. The court further stated that Professor Kerr's comments on general desirability of mandatory retirement did not violate the standards of administrative neutrality and the human rights inquiry boards were drawn from individuals who have experience and understanding of human rights issues. The ratio of this case is that the expression of views on public issues by a decision maker does not necessarily raise a reasonable apprehension of bias, especially in the case of a human rights inquiry board, where the individuals best qualified to adjudicate are often knowledgeable in the field of human rights law. The court emphasized that there must be evidence of bias on the specific issues to be decided in the case in order for a reasonable apprehension of bias to be raised. This case highlights the importance of recognizing distinction between general views of public issues and specific bias in decision making, ensuring that the decision makers are evaluated fairly and impartially. Moving on to the next case law, Great Atlantic and Pacific Company of Canada versus Ontario Human Rights Commission. The legal issue in this case was the apprehension of bias on the part of Constance Backhouse, who was appointed as the board to hear and decide complaints in issue. The position of both the employer, a and and the union was that there was a real and reasonable apprehension of bias and perhaps acts of bias on the part of Backhouse due to her background as an advocate in the matters of issues involving sex discrimination and the fact that she was a party in proceedings outstanding before the commission in which the issue of sex discrimination was raised. The court held that being an advocate for a certain cause will not automatically render one biased. However, if one is a party to a proceeding in which they are advocating a cause which is before them in the current proceedings, they are apprehended to be biased. In this case, the court found that Backhouse had gone beyond the position of an advocate and had personally become a party in the area over she was appointed to preside, in relation to the same issue that she had to decide. The court stated that simple justice requires a high degree of neutrality and that this would be not attained if Backhouse continued as the board. The court concluded that the appropriate test had not been met and that there was a reasonable apprehension of bias. Therefore, application of the union was allowed and the proceedings before the board were disqualified. This case raises the issue of appointment of human rights activists and adjudicate on complaints of discrimination under human rights codes and emphasize the importance of neutrality and impartiality in such appointments. I hope you are making notes of these case laws and what the ratios of these case laws are. Like I mentioned before, it will be really important and it will give you bonus marks in the exam if you are able to mention these case laws in the paper, if, of course, they are relevant to the question that comes. Moving on to the next case. This case is of Howard Johnson in versus Saskatchewan Human Rights Tribunal. This case dealt with the violation of Section 12 of the Saskatchewan Human Rights Code, which prohibits discrimination in denying services to public on the basis of ancestry or race. The Human Rights Tribunal found that John Pontus and Howard Johnson Inn had offended this section in relation to the treatment of a First Nations man 
in the restaurant. And the decision was appealed to the Court of Queen's Bench and later Court of Appeal, both of which dismissed the appeal. One of the big points raised in the appeal was an allegation of bias on the part of the tribunal member, Mr. Worm, due to his First Nations background and his work promoting First Nations interests and rights. The court found no merit in this argument, stating that mere fact that a person worked to promote the rights of a particular group does not disqualify them from hearing complaints related to that group. The court also rejected the argument that Mr. Worm was biased due to an unpleasant conversation with Mr. Pontus, stating that there was nothing in regard to suggest Mr. Worm was unable to act objectively and fairly in deciding the complaint. In conclusion, the court found that the argument of bias was without merit and upheld the decision of the Human Rights Tribunal. This case highlights the importance of separating personal backgrounds and experiences from the decision-making process and the necessity for impartiality in adjudicating human rights complaints. Moving on to the next case, the case of the case of Pelletier versus Canada. In this case, the issue was whether the Commissioner Gomery reached the duty of impartiality required of decision makers. It is important to note that the standard of impartiality expected of a decision maker varies depending on the role and the function of the decision maker involved. In this case, the court concluded that the applicable standard for assessing the commissioner's impartiality was somewhere between the middle and the high end of the spectrum established in the case of Newfoundland Telephone Company versus Newfoundland. Upon reviewing the evidence, the court found that there was sufficient evidence to conclude that an informed person viewing the matter realistically and practically would find a reasonable apprehension of bias on the part of the commissioner. Upon reviewing the evidence, the court found that there was sufficient evidence to conclude that an informed person viewing the matter realistically and practically would find a reasonable apprehension of bias on the part of the commissioner. The court found that the commissioner's comment in the media indicated not only that he had prejudged the issues, but also that he was not impartial towards the applicant. The court emphasized that the only appropriate forum for a decision maker to become engaged is in the hearing room of proceedings over which he or she is presiding. The primary duty of a decision maker is to remain impartial with an open mind that is amenable to persuasion. This case serves as a reminder of the importance of impartiality and need for decision makers to avoid making prejudicial statements outside the proceedings they preside over. Now we'll discuss the concept of pecuniary and other material interests in the context of bias and decision making. Pecuniary and other material interests refer to any direct financial or other material interests that an adjudicator or decision maker may have in the outcome of a matter. This type of bias is considered disqualifying in common law and is often referred to as an attitudinal bias. However, historically, even the slightest possibility of a financial interest was enough to disqualify a decision maker. However, the English Court of Appeals has recognized a de minimis exception in the case of Locabale UK Limited versus Bayfield Properties Limited. In this case, the court acknowledged that very minor financial interests may not be significant enough to affect a decision maker's impartiality. This exception reflects a sensible approach to the concept of pecuniary and other material interests in the decision making, ensuring that only genuine conflicts of interests would result in disqualification. The first case law from this topic is the Ladies of Sacred Heart of Jesus versus Armstrong's Point Association and Bulgin. The court addressed the legal standing of unincorporated association in legal proceedings and the issue of bias and interest in decision making. In this case, the municipal board was hearing an appeal from Winnipeg Zoning Board acting in a judicial capacity. The court determined that only persons recognized by law could be parties to such an appeal. A voluntary, unincorporated community association like Armstrong's Point Association did not have the necessary legal standing. Instead, it needed to appear in a representative capacity with named individuals as its representatives. Furthermore, the court found that the chairman of the municipal board was disqualified from acting on the appeal due to his property interests in the district in question and his wife's position as an executive officer of the respondent's association. 
these factors raised concerns about the interest and likely bias. The court held that disqualification on these grounds was a question involving jurisdiction of the board as per Section 58, Subsection 1 of the Municipal Board Act. This case highlights the importance of impartiality in the decision making and the legal standing of unincorporated associations in legal proceedings. Another case for this topic is Energy Probe versus Canada. Energy Probe challenged the decision of the Atomic Energy Control Board, the AECB, to renew the operating license for a nuclear generating station. The challenge was based on the alleged bias due to one of the board members, Olsen, having a material interest in the matter. Olsen was the president of a company that supplied cables to nuclear power plants and was an official or a member of several organizations that supported the use of nuclear power. The initial judgment determined that the licensing function of the AECB was administrative and subject to the doctrine of fairness, which includes a requirement of an unbiased decision maker. However, the court found that Olsen's interest was indirect, uncertain, and too remote to constitute a direct pecuniary interest or bias. Upon appeal, the Federal Court of Appeal agreed with the initial judgment and dismissed the appeal. Later, the Supreme Court of Canada adopted the position that classification of function as judicial or quasi-judicial was no longer a prerequisite to challenging a decision on the basis of bias. Moving on to the next topic of this chapter, Variations in Disqualifying Bias Standards. When discussing disqualifying bias, it is important to note that the standard of determining what constitutes bias can change depending on the context in which the decision is being made. In various situations, the level of bias requiring to disqualify a decision maker can differ significantly based on the specific circumstances of each case. For example, the standards of discriminating bias might be different when considering a decision maker's prior involvement with and attitudes towards a matter to be decided, compared to a case where the decision maker has direct financial interests. To help them determine the appropriate standard for disqualifying bias in a given context, courts may use the Baker factors. These factors are set of criteria that include the nature of the decision, the identity of the parties involved, and the relationship between the parties, among other considerations. By using these factors, courts can better determine the acceptable level of bias in a specific case. An example of a case where the Baker factors were applied is COSAC versus Canada. In this case, the court used the Baker factors to assess the level of disqualifying bias, demonstrating the importance of context when evaluating bias in a decision making. The first case law of this topic is COSAC versus Canada. The legal issue centered around whether the Board of Citizenship and Immigration had a reasonable apprehension of bias in its decision-making process. To measure the standard of impartiality expected of the Board, the Court referenced the factors identified in Baker v. Canada. Given the independence of the Board, its adjudicative procedure and functions, and the fact that its decision affected the charter rights of claimants, the Court determined that the duty of fairness owed by the Board including the duty of impartiality, fell at the high end of continuum of procedural fairness. The court held that the reasonable person in the rule against bias is not to be equated with either the losing parties or the unduly suspicious. However, the high standard of impartiality and independence applicable to the board would be reflected in the determination of whether the appellants had established a reasonable apprehension of bias. In conclusion, the court found that board had a high standard of impartiality and independence which would be reflected in determination of whether a reasonable apprehension of bias existed. The decision and ratio highlighted the importance of impartiality and independence in administrative decision making and the need for decision makers to be seen as impartial and independent to maintain public confidence in the administration of justice. Moving on to the next case law, Newfoundland Telephone Company versus Newfoundland. In this case, the dispute centered around the board's decision to disallow the cost of an enhanced pension plan for executive officers of Newfoundland Telephone Company. One of the board's members, Mr. Wells, had a history of advocating for consumer rights as municipal councillor. 
and upon his appointment to the board, he publicly stated his intention to continue championing consumer rights in an adversarial manner. The Supreme Court of Canada examined the extent to which administrative boards may comment on matters before them and the consequences if a decision is made in circumstances where there is a reasonable apprehension of bias. The court established that boards dealing with policy decisions may have a more flexible and less strict standard of reasonable apprehension of bias compared to adjudicative boards. Furthermore, once the hearing date is set, parties are entitled to expect board members' conduct to be free of any reasonable apprehension of bias. If such apprehension is established, the hearing and any subsequent orders are void. In this case, the Supreme Court of Canada determined that Mr. Wells' statements made during and after the hearing when viewed cumulatively led to a reasonable apprehension of bias. Consequently, the hearing and any other subsequent order resulting from it were declared void. Moving on to the next case of Old Street Boniface Resident Association Incorporation versus Winnipeg. The court examined the issue of bias in a municipal council's decision-making process. The court applied the Audi Alterum Partum principle, which requires decision-makers to be impartial and free of bias to the municipal council. However, the court acknowledged that some degree of prejudgment is inherent in the role of a councillor. It, it is only when a council has made an irrevocable decision that a disqualifying bias is established. The court further distinguished between partiality due to prejudgment and partiality due to personal interest. A council member is disqualified if their personal interest is so closely related to the matter at hand that it would affect their impartiality. Ultimately, the court concluded that municipality's decision-making process was free of bias and the decision was upheld. This case highlights the importance of impartiality and fairness in municipal decision-making and helps to clarify the standards for disqualifying bias in this context. The next case we'll be discussing is Save Richmond Farmland Society versus Richmond Township. This is a Supreme Court of Canada case that focused on the issue of bias of a municipal council member. The council had enacted a zoning bylaw that was declared invalid on technical grounds and a new bylaw was introduced. The council member in question had campaigned for office favoring residential development of agricultural lands and was reported to have stated that he would not change his mind regardless of what was said at public hearings required under the Municipal Act. The appellant petitioned to prohibit the council member from voting on the bylaw but was unsuccessful. During the hearing, objections were raised to the council member's participation but he did not reply to the objections. The aldermen participated in the vote, which passed by a 5-4 to four margin. The appeal was dismissed as the court found that the council members had not reached a final opinion that could be dislodged and was not disqualified by bias. The Supreme Court held that a member of municipal council is not disqualified by the reason of bias unless they have prejudged the matter to be decided to the extent of no longer capable of being persuaded. The issue in the case was whether the council had an obligation under the Municipal Act to embark upon the hearing with an open mind. The court concluded that the standard of fairness owed to the participants in the hearing process in a policy-driven zoning initiative is limited to ensuring due notice is given to affected parties and affording them a reasonable opportunity to express their views. Moving on to the next case of Scenic Canada Incorporated versus St. John's City. Scenic Canada Incorporated applied to the city of St. John's to rezone property in order to construct a seniors assisted living residence. A majority of the city council voted to reject the application. Scenic then applied for a judicial review, citing conflict of interest, bias, prejudgment, and inadequacy of the participants in the hearing process. The judge in the case found that one city councillor, Collins, had a closed mind on rezoning application and had prejudged the matter to the point that by the time the council convened to debate and decide the matter, any representations seeking to persuade them to vote for rezoning were futile. The, the judge determined that Collins' closed mind was primarily due to the opposition of those who elected him rather than legitimate planning considerations. The judge noted that while a degree of prejudgment is to be expected as a consultation and public process approaches completion, 
a vote by the council on rezoning application is expected to be considered vote following deliberation and debate by the council. The regulatory regime governing development requires councillors to bring a degree of independent judgment to their deliberations and decisions. The judge held that the fairness to the applicant and the adherence to the regulatory regime of property development require each councillor to listen to the views expressed by their colleagues, respect and be governed by the criteria against which the discretionary authority is exercised and where there has been a degree of prejudgment. Honestly, and objectively consider whether their position should be maintained. In this case, Collins did not do so, and the matter was remitted to the city for reconsideration with a comment to the future participation of Collins in question. The closed mind test, as applied in this case, is a stringent test that reflects the nature of the process and the fact that discretionary decisions are being made by an elected body. It requires councillors to bring independent judgment to their decisions even though they are elected and to make fair and impartial decisions in accordance with municipal plans and regulations. Moving on to the next topic of statutory authorization. Statutory authorization refers to a provision in a law or statute that grants permission or allows for a particular action or behavior to take place even if it would normally be considered a violation of common law principles. In this context, it refers to a situation where the law authorizes a person who may have a vested interest relationship with one of the parties or a strong point of view to participate in a decision-making process or to act as an adjudicator in a case. This authorization supersedes any requirement for impartiality or independence that may exist in common law. In other words, if a statute specifically authorizes such behavior, it takes precedence over the common law principles of impartiality and independence. This means that even if someone's involvement would typically raise concerns about bias, the statutory authorization allows them to participate in the decision-making process without violating any principles of fairness. The first case law for this topic is Proceo v. Alberta. The main issue was whether the chairman of the Securities Commission was disqualified from sitting in an adjudicative capacity due to a reasonable apprehension of bias. The appellant, Broseyu, alleged that the chairman had instructed the common staff to review their files and information about a company of which Broseyu was the solicitor and had received a report of resulting review. The Supreme Court of Canada held that as a general principle, an overlap of functions between investigation and adjudication is not permitted in law. However, there are exceptions where the overlap has been authorized by statute. In this case, the Securities Act was aimed at regulating the market and protecting the public, giving a special character to such bodies which must be recognized in assessing allegations of bias. The court found that so long as the chairman did not act outside the statutory authority and there was no evidence to show that the involvement above and there was no evidence to show involvement above and beyond his statutory duties, a reasonable apprehension of bias affecting the commission as a whole could not have been said to exist. The court emphasized the importance of considering the particular structure and responsibilities of the commission in assessing allegations of bias. This decision in Broseyu v. Alberta established that in cases where an overlap of function has been authorized by statute, the Commission may not be disqualified from hearing the matters if the Chairman did not act outside his statutory authority and there, was, and there is no evidence to show involvement beyond his statutory duties. The next case law is E.A. Manning Limited v. Ontario Securities Commission. In this case, the Ontario Securities Commission, the OSC, in, issued two notices of hearing against E.A. Manning Limited and its principles and employees over allegations of improper and unfair sales practices in the securities industry. However, the Ontario Court of Justice declared the policy statement by the OSC to be without statutory authority and the OSC had prejudged the case against the applicant. The Commission appealed that decision, but the Ontario Court of Appeal sustained the judgment of the lower court and found no evidence of prejudgment on the part of new commissioners who were not involved in the adoption of the policy statement. The court also rejected the argument that the comments made by the chair of the OSC exhibited a bias against the applicant and disqualified the other commissioners from conducting the hearings. The court also rejected 
the argument that the comments made by the chair of the OSC exhibited a bias against the applicant and disqualified other commissioners from conducting the hearing. Moving on to 2474-374-3174, Quebec Incorporated versus Quebec. Reggie de Premi de Alcohol, de Alcohol, de Alcohol, de Alcohol. Reggie de Premi de Alcohol. Again, not, I don't speak French, so please pardon me for that. This case involves the revocation of company's liquor permits by Reggie de Premi de Alcohol, de Alcohol, for violating state law. The company challenged the validity of various provisions of Quebec Liquor Licensing Statute under Section 23 of the Quebec Charter, which requires that tribunal acting in a judicial or quasi-judicial manner be both independent and impartial. The Supreme Court found that Reggie did indeed exercise judicial or quasi-judicial powers and therefore was subject to requirements of Section 23. The court held that impartiality has an institutional aspect and the constitutional guarantee of independent and impartial tribunal must be broad enough to encompass this. Next up is Katz v. Vancouver Stock Exchange, 1995, a case that dealt with the issue of independence in the context of disciplinary committee of a stock exchange. The members of the disciplinary committee of the Vancouver Stock Exchange were not appointed on set terms and were not paid. The decision of the court was that these aspects did not create a problem for the independence or impartiality. The court held that the members of the disciplinary committee were independent and impartial despite not being appointed on set terms or getting paid because they were impartial decision makers who were appointed to carry out a public function. Moving on to Sethi versus Canada, where Sethi claimed to be a convention refugee but the Minister of Employment and Immigration disagreed. Sethi made an application for redetermination and claimed apprehension of bias due to the effect of the proposed legislation about the board. The proposed legislation, Bill C-55, abolished the board and created a replacement, the Immigration and Refugee Board. The Federal Court of Appeal allowed the government's appeal, stating that the mere expression of the government's intention towards the tribunal cannot give a rise of probability that the tribunal will react in a particular way relative to the decisions it must take. In the case of Ocean Port Hotel Limited versus British Columbia, the issue was whether members of the Liquor Appeal Board were independent enough to make decisions on violations of Liquor Control and Licensing Act and impose the penalties it provides. The British Columbia Court of Appeal concluded that members of the board lacked the independence required of administrative decision makers imposing penalties. The Supreme Court of Canada allowed the appeal and remitted the matter back to British Columbia Court of Appeal to decide the issues it did not address. The court deferred to the legislature's intention in assessing the degree of independence required of the tribunal. In the case of Bell Canada versus Canadian Telephone Employees Association, the issue was whether the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal lacked independence and impartiality due to the Canadian Human Rights Commission's power to issue binding guidelines and prescribe the rate of remuneration for its members. The claimants argued that the Commission's exercise of its statutory authority compromised the tribunal's independence. However, in a later case, it was held that the tribunal's independence was not compromised by the Commission's exercise of statutory authority. The last case of this chapter is Canadian Pacific Limited versus Matsky Indian Band. Two companies were assessed for real property tax on reserve lands by Indian Bands Tribunal under the Indian Act. The companies challenged the assessment in federal court, but the application was struck down due to the existence of an adequate alternative remedy through appeal regimes of Indian Bands. The Supreme Court considered the issue of whether the Indian Bands Tribunal were impartial and independent. The court held that the principles of natural justice apply to Indian Bands Tribunal and the required level of independence depends on the nature of the tribunal and the interests at stake. The provision of assessment bylaws dealing with the powers of appeal tribunal and the appointment and remuneration of members need to be examined to ensure impartiality and independence. That's it for this chapter. In the next class, we will be talking about content of procedural obligations, issues arising from institutional decision making. See you in the next class. Bye-bye.